Well, good morning. Good to see you all. Would you join me now in opening your Bibles um, and to Romans chapter 8. If you don't have a Bible with you, they're all over the room under chairs in front of you, and you can find Romans 8 on page 944 in those Bibles. We'll be looking at verses 29 and 30 this morning. And Romans 8 has been showing us that becoming a Christian is like walking through the wardrobe into Narnia. The kids in that story walk through the wardrobe into a world that had a history they didn't know and a land they didn't know, and it was time to explore. And so when someone becomes a Christian, they do not know even a fraction of what they've just gotten in on. They trust and follow Jesus, and Romans 8 is showing us that we have stepped into something way bigger than we thought. So you decide to follow Jesus. And Romans 8 shows us that God had planned it all along. He had set His heart on you from before the creation of the world. He brought the gospel to you. He opened your heart to receive the gospel. He keeps you trusting through your life, and He'll continue to unfold His grace to you through Jesus all the way into the new creation forever. So your salvation is planned from eternity past to eternity future. And that's what Romans, or, yeah, Romans 8, verses 29 to 30 are about. This gives us security in God's eternal plan of salvation. So let's read these verses and pray together. For those whom He foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son, in order that He might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom He predestined, He also called. And those whom He called, He also justified. And those whom He justified, He also glorified. Let's pray. Our fathers, our Father, our lives are uh, before us in color and clarity every day. And so often, you and your eternal purposes are dull to us and in grayscale. So we pray that this morning you would awaken us to the wonder and beauty of your character and purposes through all eternity for your people. In Christ's name, amen. So this text is here to help us see that believers in Jesus are secure in God's eternal plan of salvation. So this text unfolds that plan with five, five key words that we just read. There's five key words that unfold the plan of redemption, foreknown, predestined, called, justified, and glorified. The Puritan William Perkins called this text the golden chain. So these are five words are like five links in an unbreakable golden chain of God's plan of redemption. So our plan this morning will be to follow each of these five links in the chain. Now, before we do this, I want to say just two big picture notes about this text. First, I want us to just be clear at the outset of why this text matters and why what we're going to see here matters. So this is here to give you a deep sense of comfort and hope especially in suffering and hardship and confusion in your life. The verse right before this, which if you were here last Sunday, we spent the morning looking at, is one of the greatest promises in the Bible. Verse 28. You can look at it again. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to His purpose. That is an incredible, sweeping promise. And it says, we know this. How do we know this? How do we know that God works everything together for our good if we're in Christ? Well, that's the question that these two verses of our text this morning answers. Our text shows us why we know that everything works together for the good of God's people. I mean, that's the logical progression here. Do you see what our text begins with? For, right? So we know that everything works together for the good of those who, for for good for those who are called according to God's purpose. How do we know that? Well, because of what verses 29 and 30 say. 
Because our life is folded into God's eternal purposes and His eternal plan of salvation. So God wants us to draw comfort from this reality in the midst of the hardest of suffering. That's the context of Romans 8. It's the suffering that comes into our lives that is before glory to come in the new creation. How do we hope in the midst of suffering? Well, one of the great promises is that God is working everything together, including suffering, including sin, everything for your good. How do we know that's true? Verses 29 and 30. So whatever's going on in 29 and 30, it's to support one of the greatest comforts ever spoken in the universe. Second note, I know that the doctrine here, these words here, their meaning is sometimes hard for us to either understand or embrace. For some people, any talk of predestination, for instance, which is one of the words here, seems irrelevant to life. I mean, leave it to the theologians. Or maybe it sounds cold and harsh. It makes God appear distant and dark. But all of this is ultimately unfolding the doctrine of God's love. This is about learning that God's love is greater than we thought. This is here to support that promise that God, from His heart of love and in His infinite wisdom and His almighty strength and power, He works everything together for good for those who are called according to His purpose. So we can know that that's true because of the realities here. So whatever we're seeing here, this is unfolding the doctrine of God's love. So let's consider this now. Five links in this golden chain of God's eternal plan of salvation. So we'll see the five links and then toward the end, uh, briefly note five questions and um, five reflections. First link, foreknown. God foreknew us with love. So verse 29 again, we're just going to walk through this phrase by phrase. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined. So what does it mean that God foreknew us? Well, we know that it's true that God knows all things ahead of time from eternity past. He foreknows everything. But this is focusing on how he foreknew Christians in particular. This is who he's been talking about here. He foreknew certain people that he would save and then work everything together for their good. And so some think that this verse refers to God knowing something about these particular people, specifically that he knows that certain people will be inclined to trust Jesus, and then that foreknowledge becomes the basis of why he chooses them or predestines them for salvation. So this would mean that verse 29 is saying God foreknew that certain people would trust Christ. Now, I don't think that's what this means or the focus of this text. So notice that this doesn't say he foreknew something about them, but he foreknew them. Do you see that? He knows them ahead of time. This is not saying he foreknows something about them, but he foreknows people. He knows certain people ahead of time. What would it mean that he knows them ahead of time? Well, the key is seeing how this language of knowing and knowing ahead of time is used throughout the Bible. The word for know or foreknow is often used relationally. The idea of knowing someone in the Old Testament is connected to his love and his choice of people, of him setting his affection on people. Here's a couple examples. In Genesis 18, 19, God's speaking about how he chose Abraham. All the people of the world, God chose Abraham. And he says, I chose him. That's how it's often translated. But the Hebrew word for chosen there that's translated I chose him is the word for know. I've known him. That's what God says. I've known him among all the people. He's saying he chose to enter into a relation with him, relationship with him. Jeremiah 1.5, God says this to the prophet Jeremiah. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you and appointed you a prophet to the nations. God foreknew, knew ahead of time relationally. Jeremiah, before he was even formed in the womb. He knew him and chose him to be a prophet. Amos 3.2, God says to Israel, you only have I known of all the families of the earth. So, of course, God knows about all the other nations, but he's saying that he had a personal relationship with Israel. He's known them. This is how Paul uses the same language of no later, just a couple chapters later, in Romans 11.2. He speaks of Israel and he says, God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. So God didn't reject the people that he knew in the sense that he loved them. 
So here's John Stott's summary. The Hebrew verb to know expresses much more than mere intellectual cognition. It denotes personal relationship, a personal relationship of care and affection. And so Paul's likely drawing on that idea here in the way that he most often uses that word. So this is about how God personally knew and loved certain people ahead of time. The triune God set his affection on certain people. He knew them before creation. He didn't do this based upon something he saw in us because of who we are, but because of his love. He didn't like you and therefore choose you and love you. He simply set his affection on you. That's what he says of Israel in Deuteronomy 7. He's like, I didn't love you because of anything lovely in you. I chose you. You're not better than other nations. In many ways, you're worse. He just chose them. He loves them. And so, let's just keep connecting this back to the main point as we go, which is to support verse 28. This is how we know the promise of verse 28 is true. How do you know all things work together for good? How do we know this? Because if you're a Christian, you were foreknown before the foundation of the world. You were chosen in love. God set His eye on you and set His heart on you. Before you were made, of course He's going to work everything together for your good. Second word, link, predestined. So God predestined us to become like Christ. Look at verse 29. Those whom He foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son in order that He might be the firstborn among many brothers. And we don't use the word predestined very much, but the word itself isn't very complicated. It's to destine something ahead of time. So Paul is saying that those whom He foreknew, He also predestined. God predestined certain people. We could summarize to become Christians, but let's consider what this means. This means we have, big picture, we have two answers to the question. The question of who decides to become a Christian. At one level, you and I have to decide. No one is saved without deciding to trust Christ. It's right and good to sing songs like, I have decided to follow Jesus. But that's not the only way to answer that question. It's also God's decision. And it's God's decision before it's ours. God predestines us before the foundation of the world. And it's His decision for us to trust Christ that's what, that's what, what guarantees our decision to trust Christ. So if you sing, I've decided to follow Jesus, that's right and true and good. And it's because God decided for you to decide to follow Jesus. Notice the purpose, though, of God's predestination. This is what stood out to me most this week studying this. It's to make us like Jesus. This says, look at this, those whom He foreknew, He also predestined, not just for an abstract salvation, but to be conformed to the image of His Son. God predestines us to be conformed to Christ's image. The idea of image is a theme that runs through the whole Bible from the very beginning, and Paul often draws on this. So Genesis 1, page 1 of the Bible, says that humanity was made in God's image. He made us to be an image that reflects God's character, that represents His rule on the earth as we live. So we're made to know God. We were made to reflect His character, be like Him, reflect His glory. His glory is His resplendent, visible beauty. It's, it's the beauty of His character shining forth. So as His image, we're meant to visibly reflect God's beauty and what He's like to the world. But when Adam and Eve sinned, they plunged the human race into sin. We now fail to represent and reflect God's character well. Paul makes the point early in Romans that we have traded the glory of God for images of creation to worship. But now Christ has come as the truest human, as the image of God, as the better Adam. So if you want a model of what humanity was always supposed to be like, look at Jesus. He's the image of God. He perfectly reflects the beauty of God in the world. Look at Him. Look at His love. Look at His compassion. Look at His service. Look at His selflessness. Look at His humility. Look at His patience. The fruit of the Spirit is another way of describing this. This is what the Spirit produces 
in God's people. It's to conform us to the image of Jesus. And so now when God saves people, that's what He's up to. This is what He predestined people for. This is why He chooses us, not just so that we can be forgiven and then live a selfish life. It's so that we can be forgiven and then transformed to become like the humans we were always meant to be, to be true humans like Jesus, perfectly reflecting Him, perfectly Christ-like. And this is already happening in the lives of Christians. This is why God gives us the Holy Spirit to make us like Jesus. And then this is what's going to be completed at the resurrection, where our bodies will be transformed to be like His resurrection body, to live in a new creation forever, and our character will perfectly reflect Him. And there's a greater purpose beyond this. The ultimate purpose is what this says next. Look at this again. Predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son in order that He, Jesus, might be the firstborn among many brothers, brothers and sisters. So God predestines us to become like Jesus so that Jesus would be the firstborn in this new family. To be the firstborn here is to have the place of preeminence. The character of Christians will have a family resemblance to Jesus, to the honor of Jesus. That's God's purpose. God did not just arbitrarily and coldly predestined people for some abstract idea of being saved. The Father has a plan to honor the Son by predestining a, predestining a people to reflect the Son's character for the glory and preeminence of the Son. And He gives us the Holy Spirit to produce that work in us. So how does this relate to the promise of verse 28? We know that God works all things together for good, for those who are called according to His purpose, because this is His purpose. This is what He's been planning all along. Your temporary suffering your confusion of why you feel the way you do, why you think the way you do, why you do what you do, your hardships, all of this is folded into a greater plan of transformation to become like Jesus. And even now, God is using your suffering to transform your character to be like Christ. So you may not have any idea how God could work your circumstance together for good. You may not have any clue how He could turn to good and work together for good, your suffering, your hardship, what you've done to someone else, what someone's done to you. But here's one thing you can know. God's purpose is to make you like Jesus for the glory of Christ. So if you are in Christ, you're part of this purpose. He's not going to fail. Third link, called. God calls us to faith in Christ. This is now verse 30. And those whom He predestined, He also called. You see how these links are tied together? Those whom He foreknows, He predestines. The assumption is all of them. All of those whom He foreknew, He predestined to become like Christ. All of those whom He predestined, He called. I mentioned last week the New Testament talks about calling in two ways. The first is what we could call a general gospel call. This is the call for all people to trust in Christ. This is an invitation that can be accepted or rejected. Come to Christ. Many don't. Many reject that. The second way is what we uh, call in theology the effectual call. This call is when God takes that general gospel call that you hear in your ears and He makes it effective for those whom He predestined. He opens their heart to believe it. They may resist for a while. They may resist for most of their life. But at some point, God opens their heart to receive and respond to that call. So the effectual call is the one that's here in verse 30. We know this because of what he says next. Those whom he called, he also justified. Right? It's not true that everyone who hears the gospel call is justified. But this is saying those whom God calls in this way, this effectual call, he justifies them. The assumption is that when he calls someone, he brings them to faith, and they're justified. So, this is a call that has such a power that it guarantees they will come to faith and be justified. We see this in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. So here's how Paul, he's writing this letter to these Christians. So he traveled into town, he preached the gospel, so he gave this general gospel call as he always did in these towns, in these cities. So he preaches, people heard, 
Some became Christians. He writes them a letter later. And here's how he opened this letter to them, the beginning of 1 Thessalonians. He said, For we know, brothers, loved by God, or brothers loved by God, we know that He's chosen you. You're thinking, well, Paul, how do you know God chose them? Here's his answer. Because our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. So he's saying, I gave the gospel call, and I know God chose you as the Christians I'm now writing to, because when I did that, there wasn't just a general gospel call happening there. That call came with such a power and conviction and the Holy Spirit that you trusted. So Paul concludes, they were clearly chosen by God ahead of time. So we've moved from eternity past then to our lived history. God foreknows and predestines people, and then at some point in time in their lives, He calls them. And that call brings them to faith and leads to the fourth link, which is justification. So the fourth link, this word justified. God accepts us and declares us righteous in Christ. That's verse 30. Those whom He called, He also justified. Justification is a courtroom term. It refers to someone who is declared to be in the right, so they're not condemned. We spent a sermon on this at the very beginning of the series here in Romans 8 in verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Through faith in Jesus, you are united to Him. And what's, what is His is yours. His righteousness counts as your righteousness. So if you're not a Christian this morning, this is the good news at the heart of the message of the Bible in Christianity. You and I deserve to be condemned because of our sin. We deserve eternal death. We were not in the right with God. We deserve condemnation to be the banner over our heads forever. But Jesus came as the only righteous one, and He was condemned on the cross, taking our condemnation, bearing our sins, the punishment for our sins. And then He rose again, and He was declared to be in the right. He was vindicated and justified. And now this says that all those who trust in Him receive that justification with Him. We're in the right with God. There is no condemnation now or ever for those who are in Christ Jesus. So this is a call for you to respond and receive this message and be forgiven and declared righteous. So repent from your sins and trust in Jesus, and there's no condemnation over you final link, glorified. It's the last phrase of verse 30. Those whom He justified, He also glorified. What does it mean to be glorified? Well, this is connected to what Paul said earlier. We are predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son. That's another way of referring to glorification. God made humanity in His image to reflect His character, to reflect His glory it's one way where God's glory would fill the earth as water covers the sea, as His image bearers reflect His glory and His beauty, the beauty of His character around the world. But we failed to do that. We failed to glorify God and reflect His glory. And so Jesus came as the one who perfectly reflects the image of God and therefore is glorious. He came to restore us also to this role of reflecting God's character in the world. So, as we become like Christ, we're reflecting God's glory again. We're being glorified. This is how Paul puts it in 2 Corinthians 3.18. Listen to this. He says, we all, speaking of Christians, we all with unveiled face are beholding the glory of the Lord. So, we do this by faith. There's a, a sight of the heart that we have as we get to know Jesus and we see His glory. We behold His glory. And here's what Paul says next. And we are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. This is a summary of the Christian life. Beholding the glory of the Lord and by the Spirit's power being transformed into that same image from one degree to another. Increasingly reflecting the image of Jesus as we know Him and love Him. We become like Him and we're being glorified. Here's what this means. At the heart of being a Christian is knowing Jesus and enjoying Him, beholding Him, being in wonder of Him. And as we do this, we start to become like Him. I mean, this is a principle of all of life. We become like what we worship. 
right? You become like the people you respect. And this is saying we reflect the image of Jesus as we worship Him. So when Christians grow, they're being glorified. When you, this afternoon, if you by the Holy Spirit's power are in a very frustrating situation and you refuse to yell in anger but patiently listen, you are reflecting glory. When you invite someone over and your main goal is to fill them with encouragement, you are reflecting glory. When you serve various ministries in our church family or in non-programmed ways in everyday life, you're reflecting and radiating glory as you do that with humility. When we see other members of the church serving us and one another, we're watching God glorify His people. Paul calls the church the glory of Christ. We're being glorified. There's a sense in which then glorification has already begun for Christians. We're already being glorified because this is about being transformed into Christ's image. But the process is certainly not yet complete. We reflect His glory faintly. We're waiting for the return of Jesus when we'll see Him as He is, have a perfect sight of Him, not just visibly, but with the, visibly, but the eyes of the heart, worshiping Him fully and truly to the core of our soul, and we'll become like Him, perfectly reflecting His character. And then Jesus will have this family that has resemblance, reflecting His glory, and He will be preeminent. He'll be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters, and it'll be a beautiful Jesus character reflecting family. We'll be glorified. So this is the last link in the chain. And this, this five-link golden chain, and there's a bunch of other links that we could fill in from other texts as well, this is what gives us confidence in the promise of verse 28. So we know that God works all things together for the good of those who are called according to His purpose. How do we know that? Because if you're called according to His purpose, it means He foreknew you from eternity past. And He predestined you to become like Jesus. And at some point in your life, He called you effectually to trust in Jesus. And He justified you. And He glorified you. You are secure in God's eternal plan of salvation. So how do we respond to this? I want to answer answer five quick questions and give five reflections. So five quick questions. Does this teaching mean that Christians, if they believe this, will become arrogant because they think they're special? No. This should be the most humbling doctrine Christians believe. We are not saved because we are more spiritually inclined than other people. We are not saved because God saw something different in us. We were saved because of God's love, because He set His heart on us, because He foreknew us in love, and He predestined us. We had nothing to do with it. This should be a pride-killing doctrine. If someone speaks about this doctrine in a prideful way, they do not yet fully believe the doctrine they are claiming to believe and teach. Second, does predestination mean some who want to come to Christ for salvation can't be saved? No. Jesus said, all who come to me will be raised up on the last day. But he also said, no one can come to me unless the Father draws him. So the reality is that if God did not foreknow and predestine and call, then no one would respond to the general gospel call to come to Him. If you want to trust Jesus and you come to Him in faith, you will be saved. And it's because God foreknew you and He predestined you and He called you and He overcame your resistance to Him that we are all born with. No one would come to Him. We are dead in our trespasses and sins. We don't need someone to sense to throw a rope overboard for us to grab onto because we're drowning. We're already dead at the bottom of the sea. We need Him to bring us to life. Third, if God predestined people for salvation, does this mean we don't need to evangelize? Isn't it already figured out? No. In the very next chapter, I mean, yes, we do need… How do you answer that question, not double negative? 
We do need to evangelize. In the very next chapter, Paul talks about how he weeps over those who are lost. And then in chapter 10, he says, we have to send, how will people know if we don't send people to preach the gospel? How will they hear? This teaching should motivate us to share the gospel because we know we're part of God's plan and he can overcome the resistance of any human heart. He's the one who calls. Fourth, if God predestined us for glorification, does this mean we don't need to pursue holiness? No. Holiness is essential to the Christian life. It's essentially becoming like Christ. If this is the very reason why God predestines us, for us to become like Jesus, this is what we should be about. Fifth, does this mean we can't really know if we're predestined? No. If, ev- if even one link in this chain is true of you, then all the links in the chain are true of you. It's an unbreakable chain. So if you are trusting in Jesus and have been justified, then that's because you are part of this chain. And that means you have been foreknown and predestined and called, which is why you responded in faith and are justified. So if you're not trusting in Christ right now, that does not necessarily mean that you're not predestined. No one should think they have confidence in this. Just because you're not trusting in Christ now doesn't mean that four seconds from now, you'll still be in that same situation. No one should lose heart or hope, no matter what you've done. You're not outside of coming to Jesus. Trust Christ. And if you do, you find out you are predestined or foreknown. It's arrogant to claim that you know you're not. There's so much more to say. just wanted to at least quickly address a few of those questions. So five reflections here uh, at the end. So one word for each reflection. Number one, mystery. We do not know how all this works. This golden chain of salvation is just a small glimpse into God's purposes. So, I mean, the infinite God with infinite wisdom and love and goodness and power cannot be summed up in these little five words that are right before us on the page. Um... We should acknowledge there's mystery. I remember reading through um, Institutes of the Christian Religion by John Calvin, who's often associated with some of these doctrines because he talked about them, um, and some people disagreed with him. And uh, he certainly does in this kind of massive work that he wrote on theology. It's not the heart of it, though, um, of his work. And actually, the thing that struck me most in reading through that by the time I was done, the thread that went through that, uh, that book more than any others was this emphasis where he kept saying, we do not want to say more than what the Bible says of God. We also don't want to say less. We don't want to believe more than God's revealed and just speculate as if we can figure all this stuff out and as if there's no mystery. But we also don't want to ignore things that he's revealed. So I just think that is such a helpful posture for us to have. So there is mystery here. Let's not try to figure all this out if it's not clear, in the, if the God has not revealed it to us. But let's not also pretend that God hasn't revealed these things to us. Let's not say less than he said and say, well, that's mysterious. But it's right there. <laughs> so let's believe what God's revealed and then not plunge into speculation. Let's embrace mystery, but let's not call it too quickly. Second, wonder. We are getting a small glimpse, but an amazing glimpse into the wonder of God's eternal purposes. Like It's like the, some of those glimpses we get of the galaxies, you know, just this, these, you know how to describe it. These, I'm not going to use words because you're going to say you said those wrong um, if you actually know what I don't know. So, you know, these Hubble telescopes and the new thing, I don't even remember what it's called. You know what I'm talking about, right? And then you find out it's like this tiny sliver. We, we hardly see anything. That's what this is. Right? We get this little glimpse of something way bigger. And so let's just marvel at God. Celebrate what we see. Don't ignore it and say it's all mysterious up there. No, like we can see some stuff. And then just marvel at what we see and what might be beyond. Third, security. Let this doctrine be your security in your salvation and your suffering. It's why these verses are here in Romans 8. Paul didn't just decide to say, you know, I want to talk some theology. 
He's comforting sufferers. That's what he's doing here. So let's develop the skill of letting our suffering and our hardships lead us to look to God. Let your pain lead you to pay attention to God's bigger purposes, to give you perspective. When you zoom out of the pain of your life, where you zoom in, it's just painful and confusing. Zoom out to the bigger purposes and perspective of God's plan from eternity past to eternity future that you are caught up in. Start your day, maybe with a specific way of remembering who God is and how you are caught up in His drama. End your day as you have anxieties and cares on your mind and heart by casting those on God, knowing He cares for you because He's cared for you before you even existed. Fourth, purpose. This gives us purpose in life. You wonder, why, why am I here? Why are you here? What are we doing? Do we have purpose? Is there meaning? What are we supposed to be doing? I'm a Christian now. Now what? Well, we're seeing that from before the foundation of the world, God had a plan, and that plan was to honor Christ by creating a people who live for Christ's glory and reflect His character. And God is unfolding this plan. Salvation is not just about giving you forgiveness and then sending you off to figure out how to make something of life or to go on living a selfish life. It's about folding you into God's eternal plan to honor the Son. This is the purpose then and should be the purpose of every Christian in every Christian's life. Um, you know, I quote John Stott a bunch over, the, over time and recommend his resources. He was a wonderful man. And I came across his final sermon this past week. And his final sermon was on this topic, and this was one of the texts that he used. And so after a lifetime of walking with Christ and studying the Bible and helping other people learn to read the Bible for themselves and know God, here's what he said. Christ-likeness in the mystery of suffering. Suffering is a huge subject in itself, and there are many ways in which Christians try to understand it. One way stands out, that suffering is part of God's process of making us like Christ. Whether we suffer from a disappointment, a frustration, or some other painful tragedy, we need to try to see this in light of Romans 8, 28 to 29. According to Romans 8, 28, God is always working for the good of his people. And according to Romans 8, 29, this good purpose is to make us like Christ. So after a lifetime of walking with Christ and studying the Bible, that's what he wanted to say. Let's live to become like Jesus. And this is our purpose as a church. Our purpose as a church, right at the heart of our statement, is to be and make disciples of Jesus. This is what that means. To be a disciple of Jesus is to learn from Jesus to become like Jesus. To make disciples is to help other people learn from Jesus to become like Jesus. This is our vision for a church. Our vision is the same as God's vision when he predestined people from before the foundation of the world. It's to lead ourselves and one another to become like Christ so that Christ might become the firstborn among this church family and far beyond. Finally, mission. We know that God has a people whom he's foreknown and he's predestined, and not all of them have come in yet. And God gives you and I the privilege of speaking the gospel to our family, our children, our grandparents, our aunts, our uncles, our neighbors, our co-workers, uprooting and going to other nations and to reach the least reached to bring the message of Jesus to them and watch God call people home. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for what you've revealed to us. We do want this heart posture and this commitment to seek to understand what you have revealed and also to not go beyond into speculations. And so we thank you for what you've revealed. We thank you for who you are. We thank you for your plan of salvation from everlasting to everlasting. We thank you that we're caught up in this.
We thank you for this incredible promise to work together everything for our good. And so we pray that what we saw this morning, you would let stay with us. We pray that your spirit would bring it to mind in the mornings and evenings and in suffering and throughout a day, and that you would use us to bring many, many more to yourself through Jesus by the powerful working of the Holy Spirit. Amen.